Verse 11 says this. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. The Lord Jesus Christ, John chapter 17 here, verses 11 through 19 specifically, the Lord Jesus Christ expresses a great love for his own, a great love for his own, in a special way, a particular way, a a saving and redemptive way, Christ loves those who have been given to him by the Father out of the world. So now here in John chapter 17, verses 11 through 19, in that love for his own, the Lord Jesus Christ now prays on their behalf to the Father. He does not pray for the world, he says, but he prays for those the Father has given him out of the world. Specifically in verse 11, the Lord is referring here to his disciples. But what he prays here, again, is true of and applies to all of his disciples, not just these 11 men. This is as much a prayer for his bride, the church, as it is for his disciples. And he mentions all believers here in verse 20. Now, this, the Bible now describes this particular love between Christ and his church as the love that a godly husband has for his bride. We know that scripture teaches that. We've seen that many times. So imagine the scene, if you will, where we are in John chapter 17. The father of the bride takes her hand in his and he walks his bride down the aisle. Now, as they approach the groom, the father gives her to the groom by placing her hand in his. You ever wondered what that pictures, right, in a wedding ceremony? The bridegroom loves his bride. We know that he loves her to the uttermost. That's what he says in John chapter 13. And he delights in her and he nourishes her. He cherishes her. And he's given responsibility to keep her, to protect her, to provide for her. But imagine the scene. At the end of the ceremony, he has to leave her. And he has to leave her in a very dangerous place, a place that is surrounded by enemies. Jesus says in verse 11, I am no longer in the world, but my bride is in the world. Do you see? I'm no longer in the world, but these, those whom you have given me out of the world, those are in the world. My own are left in the world. Now he speaks here, I am no longer in the world. He speaks here of his departure by means of the cross. And that departure is so certain that he speaks of it as a present reality. I am, he says, no longer in the world. The cross is certain. His resurrection is certain. He goes to redeem his bride at the cross, and in redeeming her, he leaves her behind in this wicked world. Now notice he does not say there in verse 11 that these are of the world. He says of believers that they are in the world. And note the difference, okay? Jesus says of his own chosen people in John chapter 15, verse 19, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. As we come to verse 14, he says the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. In verse 16, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. The Lord is saying here that those whom he loves, those whom he will give his own life for on Calvary are about to be left in danger in a dangerous place surrounded by enemies. They're about to be left in this wicked world. Now, the world hates the bride because it hates the bridegroom. John chapter seven, it hates the bridegroom because he testifies of it that its works, its deeds are evil. This world, we know this to be true. This world, as the Bible describes it, is enemy controlled territory under the sway of the wicked one. This world is under the satanic rule of the prince of the power of the air. It is a masterfully crafted, insidiously deadly system of corrupting toxins, relentlessly and constantly gorged on and vomited out by its depraved inhabitants. It is a black plague of sin that creeps into every corner, polluting every part, polluting every person. Its allurements are powerfully seductive. 
Every temptation is a death trap. It's laid for the express purpose of catching souls. Every pit leads down into hell. If I could come up with more (laughs) biting adjectives, I would. How does the Bible describe the world? How does the Bible describe this world? This world is an enemy of your soul. It's one of three enemies, the first of three, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Secondly, this world is the the quintessential adulteress. It is a seductive whore who is at enmity with God. Those who go in the way of this world are themselves called adulterers and adulteresses. They are described as committing spiritual adultery. Why is that? It's because of their worldliness. Through worldliness, they commit spiritual adultery. James chapter four, verse four, James says, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. S. Lewis Johnson said this, he said, to permit the world to take the place of the Lord's proper preeminence in the believer's life is to be guilty of spiritual adultery. You're an unfaithful bride when you do that. Thirdly, this world, what we know of it, hates Christians. And it has shown itself quick to vent its hostility on Christians. I read an article last week that this is, this last year, the most deadly year in recorded history for Christians. More martyrs now than there ever have been. People killed for seeking to advance the cause of Christ or killed for Christian values, killed because of Christ. And we'll see that more now as we come to verse 18. In John chapter 16, if you look back just one page, John chapter 16, verse two, speaking of the world and its hostility and hatred, the Lord says that they will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. Fourth, this world is not our home. This world is not our home. The world passes away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. So living in this world, like living in a tuberculosis ward, right? Right? Everywhere you turn, there's an infectious disease that will kill you if it's left unchecked. And that disease is highly contagious. You are walking through a dangerous disease portion of the CDC without a hazmat suit. <laughs> and everywhere, there are, there's an infectious disease that if you don't keep yourself unspotted from it, it will kill you. And there's no way, there's no way that you're going to make it apart from the protection provision, power, and preservation of the great physician. He alone is able to keep that which you've committed to him until that day. Later, John's gonna warn believers to stay clear of this world. They are in it, but they can't be of it. And if we don't talk about this a little bit, uh, we're gonna be doing malpractice here. We need to turn to John chapter two and look at an an example of this. First John chapter two, As you're turning, we get a glimpse or an understanding of the danger of this world in the Lord's prayer in John chapter 17. God, keep them from this world. Those whom you've given to me out of the world, I'm leaving in the world. God, keep them, keep them. While I was with them, I kept them through your name. Now, Holy Father, I come to you and I ask you to keep them in my absence, so to speak. Why is that? Because the world is a dangerous place and we're not to be worldly. Look at 1 John chapter two and drop down to verse... 15. Stay clear of the enticements of this world. John begins in John 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, with a very clear command. He says in verse 15, do not love the world or the things in the world. Don't do it. Right? Clear command from John. Now, here next are his reasons why. Look at the second part there of verse 15. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is of the world or is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. 
Now, if you look at verse 15, first part of verse 15, you have the command. Don't love the world. Don't love the things in the world, right? Then from the second part of verse 15 through 17, you have basically four component parts that we want to break down as reasons why you're not to love the world. Let's look at the first one together, the second half of verse 15 there. If anyone loves the world, John says, the love of the Father is not in him. In other words, don't love the world. Don't love the things of this world. Why? Because love for this world is a mark of someone enslaved to their sin and bound for hell. Right? If you love this world, if you pine after the things of this world, you're like Lot's wife, pining after the wickedness of Sodom, right? She turns, she turns into a pillar of salt. You're Demas. You're a Demas forsaking your brothers in love with this present world. Now, can a Christian, if you think about this command, can a Christian, a genuine Christian, slop around sometimes in the pigsty of this world? Yes. Get in the mud, get filthy. Sadly, yes, Christians can do that. But be warned. There's a warning here. Someone might say, well, once saved, always saved. No, there's a real valid warning here that if you depart from the faith for love of the things of this world, you were never saved to begin with. They went out from us because they were not of us. Had they been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out that it might be made manifest. They were not of us. Can a genuine Christian slop around in the mud of this world? Yes, but be warned. Your love for Christ will crowd out your love for this world or your love for this world will crowd out your professed love of Christ. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Secondly, verse 16 John says, for all that is in the world, for all that is in the world is not of the Father, but is of the world. And what in the world is he referring to? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Do you see? The lust of the flesh, sinful desires for those things that would, that would please us physically. Food, right? Gluttony, sex, leisure, maybe sleep, maybe rest. Some of these things not bad in and of themselves, right? But we with our corrupt natures make them sinful. Time-wasting distractions, alcohol, drugs, pain medication, neglect of responsibilities, the lusts of the flesh, sinful desires for those things that would please us physically. But also, 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, the lust of the eyes. Sinful desires for those things which are pleasing in our sight. We covet them. Discontentment with those things that you already have. Maybe entertainments, right? What you watch on TV, what you see at the movies. Some new car you got, you got your eye on. Some new trinket, right? Some new job, some new apartment, some new life that you want. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. The first two, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, represent sinful desires for things we don't have. Things that you don't have, but that you want, right? The pride of life represents a sinful pride regarding those things that you do have. The word there for life, that Greek word, has the sense of livelihood or the means by which we live. It's pride in the things that we possess. Pride of life is pride in those things that we possess possess, clenching onto our money, having this world's goods and closing off your heart to your brother in need. Pride of life, showing off your beach body all over social media, <laughs> showing off your muscles, some immodest, if I see one more picture, right? The, the, the angle of the camera, just position, right? Plastering pictures of yourself all over Facebook. It's foolish pride. Pride of life. 
So in other words, think about it with me. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Everything in this world system that arouses your sinful desire or arouses your sinful pride. Everything in this world system that arouses your sinful desire or arouses your sinful pride. Everything in this world system that diverts your gaze from God and plunges you, it plunges you into idolatry. Verse 16 says, all of that, all of that is not of the Father, but is of the world. Thirdly, verse 17, first part of verse 17, this world is passing away and the lust of it. The world is passing away. What John is saying there is, listen, don't covet a ride on the Titanic. Don't get on the boat. Don't take the ticket. Don't go up the gangway. Stop storing up your treasure in your stateroom on the Titanic. Let it all go, right? Paul says, we brought nothing into this world and it's certain we can carry nothing out. Having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. Those who desire riches, right? Those who desire the things of this world, Paul says, fall into many temptations and snares, into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. This world is passing away and the lust of it is passing away. We are citizens of a world that is yet to come. Verse 17, the second part of verse 17, and fourthly, he who does the will of God abides forever. He who does the will of God abides forever. Loving the world here is contrasted with doing the will of God. The one who does the will of the Father is the one who loves the Father, right? Do not love the things of this world, the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So back in John chapter 17 now, John chapter 17. That's this world that the Lord is referring to when he prays in John chapter 17. We live in that world. So I thought about this and the Lord's prayer for our protection, our preservation in this world. Um, I think the, the real danger of worldliness for professing Christians, right? The real danger is that especially in our day and age, especially in this culture, right? Uh, Dale was talking about Malawi a minute ago and just the difference between our culture and that culture is great. The way in which we live, the culture in which we live, the context in which we live makes it really difficult, I think, for cultures to recognize or acknowledge worldliness The real danger is that many professing Christians don't see it. They don't see it as an encroaching worldliness. This world is a dangerous, soul-destroying place. And yet, so many professing Christians today are appallingly worldly. They're not being kept through his name from the world. They're not being kept from the evil one. They're being overcome by it. When you see professing Christians that are worldly, they're not being kept, they're being overcome. Being friends with this world makes you an enemy of God. Being friends with this world makes you an enemy of God. Stay away from worldliness. Live for Christ. In our text in John chapter 17, genuine Christians are kept through his name and sanctified by his truth. If you look at those two petitions of our Lord in verses 11 through 19, keep them through your name and sanctify them by your truth. If the Lord Jesus Christ prays to to God the Father to keep them through his name and to sanctify them by his truth, we then must rely upon him to be kept. And we must follow him by faith and obey his word, his truth, to be sanctified, right? We have a responsibility in that. That's God's sovereignty, man's responsibility. Genuine Christians kept through his name, sanctified by his truth, and so Christians must rely on him to be kept and to follow his word to be sanctified, follow his truth to be sanctified. Now think about this practically with me for a moment. And again, we need to spend some time talking about this. This world, this world is full of, of things that will entice the desire or entice the pride 
even of a genuine Christian, James says, each one of us is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. And it's when that desire has conceived, James says, that it gives birth to sin. So now if you're a Christian then, if you're a Christian, the biblical pattern or the the pattern of your life, the habit of your life then must be to biblically deal with your desires. You have to biblically deal with your desires and the choices that you make. If each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed, and it's when that desire conceives that it gives birth to sin, then we must be in the habit of dealing biblically with our own desires. The first thing that you do to deal biblically with them is to acknowledge the desire. Acknowledge the desire, see the desire. You may say to yourself, I want a house, right? I want a new house, a new apartment, a new place to live. I want a husband, I want a wife, I want a new TV. I want some time off, I wanna take a vacation. I want a drink, I wanna smoke. I want to be angry. I want a new job. I want a new tattoo. (laughs) If you know that that desire is sinful, then pray and repent immediately. Immediately upon the acknowledgement of the desire, that is a sinful desire, then pray and repent immediately. If you need to, do some radical amputation. Cut it off. Cut off your hand, gouge out your eye. Do business with God, starve it out, deny yourself, take action against it if you acknowledge that the desire is sinful. Secondly, once you acknowledge the desire, then judge biblically according to God's word. Is the desire worldly? Is the desire worldly? Is it influenced by the lust of the flesh? Does that desire arise from the lust of the eyes? Or does it fuel the pride of life? Do you want that thing, that job, that drink, that person, that pleasure, that home, whatever it is, that time, do you want that thing because you love God or because you love yourself? Determine if the desire is worldly. Are you under the power of it? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. Is it wasteful? of your time or your resources. Ephesians chapter five, verses 15 through 18. Does it fuel your pride? Does it merely gratify your flesh? Does it arise from God's wisdom or is it man's wisdom, which is foolishness? Can you in good conscience entrust yourself to Christ in it? I want this thing and I can entrust myself to Christ in it, and he will be faithful to uphold me in it because this is an honorable thing to Christ, right? Can you in good conscience entrust yourself to Christ in it? Can you do it in faith? Can you do it in faith? Does it draw you away from him or toward him? And can you pray for it and ask for Christ to be glorified in it? Is the desire worldly? If it's worldly, you can't do it, right? All that is to be done is to be done for the glory of God, right? All that is to be done is to be done for the glory of God. Paul says, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Colossians. In everything, give thanks. Do all to the glory of God. That means you're not at liberty to make choices apart from him, right? You are not your own. You were bought at a price, therefore glorify God, right? Thirdly, one, acknowledge the desire. Two, determine if the desire is worldly. Or three, is Christ at the center of your choice? Is Christ at the center of that desire? Will this help me to love him more, worship him more, serve him more? Will it help me to glorify him more? And I'm gonna work overtime. Will that help you serve God more, glorify God more? I'm gonna watch another episode while I'm binge watching this thing on Netflix, well, watching another episode, another episode, another episode, another show, another show, and another show, will that help you love him more, learn of him more, worship him more, love him more? Is, Is Christ at the center of that choice? Listen, you are not your own, right? Or is that wasteful of time or resources? Is that dissipation? 
I'm going to buy that car. Why are you going to buy that car, right? I'm going to move to that area. Well, under what circumstances are you going to move to that area? Again, these are situations that could go either way, right? But you have to determine with a clear conscience before God, between you and God, you have to determine, you have to deal biblically with your desires, If you don't, then you trail off into worldliness, into gratifying your flesh, the lust of the the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. I know some of you in this room who have bought houses specifically because there was a a big room in the front of the house would be perfect for fellowships, (laughs) right? That's the reason you bought the house. This would be great for fellowships. I know others have bought houses because you want to provide a place for your kids to play and they didn't have that before, right? Or you want to buy a house because you'd make a wise, you can take any choice that you make, right? And you can run it through that kind of a filter. This would be a wise investment, that one wouldn't be, right? Are those things honoring to the Lord? Yes. But if you're not careful, if you're not depending upon God and running everything through the filter of God's word, they can also be the products of your sinful flesh. Choices that you make that gratify your flesh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. The world is a dangerous place for the Christian. And we're constantly confronted by it. Andrew Murray said this. He said, there is nothing in the Christian life, there's nothing the Christian life suffers more from than the subtle and indescribable worldliness that comes from the cares of, or the possessions of this life. So back in John chapter 17. John chapter 17, verse 11. This world is where the Lord is about to leave his disciples, his bride, those whom the Father has given to him as a gift. He knows, the Lord knows, they will not endure to the end without God's protection, without God's preservation of them. Now that reality fuels and drives the Lord's first petition for his people in John chapter 17, verse 11. The Lord prays, I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me. No doubt we need keeping. We are prone to wander. And so what the Lord Jesus Christ does in verse 11 then is he places the salvation of his people into the loving care of the Father. As wicked as the world is, the power of the Father to keep them is infinitely greater. Paul said, I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I've committed to him until that day. Now in John chapter 17, verse 11, as he addresses the Father, he draws a distinction between whose we are and where we are. With this wicked world as our backdrop, he addresses the first person of the Trinity, not only as Father here, but as Holy Father. God the Son who is holy, praying to God the Father who is holy, that he would keep those he has given to the Son until that day, his bride, that they would be presented to himself in holiness, right? A glorious church without blemish. Verse 11 says that they may be one as we are. And part of that oneness with the Godhead is a oneness in holiness. We'll see that as we work through the second part of this text. So Jesus prays, I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me. Keep me there means to watch over, to hold fast, to stand guard over. Preserve them, Father, while they are in this world. They're going to face hostility. They're going to face temptation. Without me physically there with them to keep them, Father, I'm praying that you would keep them. Jesus said in verse 12, look at verse 12. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those you have, who you have given me, I have kept, and none of them is lost, except that one that was foreordained to be lost, right? That one prophesied in the scripture. None of them is lost, except that son of perdition that the scriptures might be fulfilled. In other words here, Judas wasn't a failure. The Lord Jesus Christ isn't saying here that none of them was lost, but then I failed with Judas. And we all know that to be true. Judas was foreordained to be lost. Judas was a part of the plan all along. If you look at the words there, lost, verse 12, and the word perdition from verse 12, you get a sense here of what we are being kept from. When the Lord prays, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, we get a sense here of what we're being kept from. The word lost there, was lost, is a verb meaning destroyed or perished. 
perdition, a name that, son of perdition that characterizes both Judas's nature, his character, and his destiny. The word perdition there means destruction, means waste or ruin. He was a son of destruction. The Lord Jesus Christ here, thinking about those words, is asking God the Father to preserve us for salvation, that we would endure to the end and be saved. If you look down at verse 15, there's another indication in verse 15. I do not pray, the Lord says, that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. The evil one is Satan, the one who seeks to destroy, the one who seeks to devour. So we're being prayed for here that the Father would preserve us unto the end so that we might be saved. He's praying for our eternal salvation, our completed salvation. Now again, someone might say, well, once saved, always saved, right? I can't lose my salvation. Once I'm saved, I'm always saved. That's true. We need to understand that in a biblical context, right? The Bible teaches eternal security, but the Bible teaches eternal security in the context of God's preserving power and man's responsibility to persevere. We have to understand those means. God uses means. He uses the means of the intercessory work of Christ on our behalf. Christ here praying for us, right? He uses the means of his own power, his own might to preserve us. He uses the means of the work of the spirit of God in the believer to preserve us. And he uses the means of the believer's living and working faith. He uses means to accomplish his ends. And in verse 11, and then again in verse 12, we see the means by which they are kept. It says there, his name. We are kept through his name. The Lord prays, I come to you, Holy Father. Keep through your name those whom you have given me. Keep us from falling away to perdition. Keep us safe. Hold us fast. Keep us from turning away. And do that, Lord, through your name. Keep us through your name. There's a couple of different ways to think about this based on the grammar especially here in verse 11. When he says, keep them in your name, one, that could mean keep them loyal to you, right? Keep them devoted to you. Or secondly, keep them through your name. Same Greek word could be translated in or through. Keep them through your name has, expresses means there, instrumental force, right? He keeps them through his power, his might, because of his character, his promises, keep them through your name. That's clear if you think about this passage that both senses are meant, right? Both senses are meant here. The psalmist prayed, David prayed, save me, O God, by your name. Vindicate me by your strength. Proverbs calls the name of the, God, uh, the, name of the Lord a strong tower, a strong tower. So one, he's keeping us devoted, keeping us loyal to him keeping us faithful, keeping us in the faith, so to speak. And he does that through his name, the instrumental force of his name, his power, his might, because of his character. And there's another decision. If you look at verse 11, another decision to make based on the text. If you have an, a new King James, your Bible reads, keep through your name those whom you have given me. That aligns with the text that comes before it. The Lord is praying not for the world, but for those whom you have given me from out of the world, right? So that clearly makes sense. But look at if you have an ESV or an NASB, another translation, many of them say, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, right? It's a variant in the text. Again, if we look at these, both of these senses are true. There's a sense in which, one, God keeps those whom he has given to the Son out of the world. And we know that to be true. That's, those are the ones that are going to be saved that God preserves to the end to be saved, right? There's also a truth that in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ being the perfect revelation of the Father, keeps them in his name, in the name which God has given him as the perfect revelation of God the Father in God the Son. The second the second sense there, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, seems to refer to the, the power, the might, the character represented by the name, the name of God the Father, given in the perfect revelation of his son. So here's the sense. If you think about that passage, right? Here's the sense. 
the Lord comes and he prays to God the Father. Holy Father, by your strength, this is what the Lord is saying, right? By your strength, by your power and your might, because of your great love and your mercy and your grace, because the gifts and calling of our immutable God are irrevocable, Preserve them, Lord, in your faithfulness. Preserve them um, in faithfulness and devotion and in obedience to you by your grace. Preserve them in your son until our salvation is complete, until we shall finally enjoy our purchased possession promised in Christ when we were engraved upon the palm of his hand and our names were written down in the Lamb's book of life from all eternity, right? This is, some of that language borrowed from our confession, this is the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. The doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. But you notice here that he's praying to God the Father, right? Perseverance, our perseverance doesn't depend upon us. Doesn't depend upon them. Doesn't depend upon their strength. It depends upon God. And God will never fail in that work Listen to Psalm 121, I love this. I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. I praise God. You know, as the Lord prays in John chapter 17, a Peter was obviously standing there listening to him pray, right? If you think about Peter and being in Peter's shoes, having heard the Lord pray this way on his behalf, and then just in a short time, abandoning the Lord Jesus Christ in the garden, right, fleeing. And while the Lord was going through his mock trial, Peter denying him three times before the next morning. Just, Peter's weakness, right? Peter's compromise, his sin in that, denying the Lord, fleeing him, abandoning him. But having heard this prayer in John chapter 17, right? And then meeting the Lord on the beach where the Lord restored Peter. He came to see this prayer, I'm sure, as precious, right? I think about all the times that you're prone to wander, that you would fail, you would fail if it weren't for God, right? If it weren't for his grip on you, you would surely, surely be lost. These words should be precious to you. This prayer should be precious to you. Peter came to see them as precious. Listen to what he wrote in 1 Peter chapter one. Peter wrote this, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy, has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by your own strength. No, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. How foolish it is, right? How foolish it is to think that I somehow in my strength, my wisdom, my power, quote unquote, cooperate with the grace of God to achieve my endurance, to achieve my preservation, to achieve my sanctification. Listen, it is all of grace, all of grace. Our salvation from start to finish is monergistic. It's monergistic. God uses means, God uses means. So what are we to do then? Knowing that God uses means, do we, just, do we just sit back, right? Do we just sit back and reflect on all that has been done for us? We let go and let God do everything? No. Do we just, do we just float down the river of our redemption on flowery beds of ease? No. We're commanded to persevere. 
We're commanded by God to persevere and we're commanded to persevere through the means that he has appointed. Salvation, our salvation start to finish is monergistic. One alone working, that is God. It is all of grace. But we are commanded because God uses means, we are commanded to persevere. And God uses the means of our perseverance, uses the means of our labor, the means of our faith, the the means of our working, the means of our love, the means of our godly fear. God uses means to preserve us. For an example of that, and quickly, turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, let me give you an example of this. The genuine believer will persevere in the faith, not because they are so strong and wise, but because God is strong and wise. Hebrews chapter 10, look at verse 19. Therefore, brethren, right? Understanding these things, knowing these things. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Why? Because he who promised is faithful. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Why? Why? Because if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. That is strong language. If you turn from Christ back to this world, if you turn as a pattern of life, as your choice, your pattern, turn back to living for yourself, sinning willfully, There no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. God even uses the fear that that rebuke, that warning should invoke in us, provoke in us, even uses that to help us persevere in the faith. Don't leave Christ. Don't turn back. Verse 28, anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will be thought, uh, will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. We're to persevere. Knowing that he keeps us by his power, we're to persevere. Now that keeping, that keeping back in John chapter 17 has two essential purposes from the text. In verse 11, first purpose that they may be one as we are. The second purpose for that is seen in verse 13 that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Two glorious purposes. First, verse 11, they may be one as we are. As we are there, speaking of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, that we may be one with the members of the Godhead, one with the Trinity. That's not one in nature, one in essence. It's not one in sameness. It is one unified With them. In other words, the eventuality of our redemption is that we will have eternal and unfettered oneness with God. We will dwell with God, He will be our God, and we will be His people, right? Not sameness, but a perfected unity, right? 
one in perfect love, one in perfect holiness, right? One in perfect joy, one with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Even now, if you think about your salvation, right? You're in Christ and Christ is in you. Christians are said to be in the Spirit and the Spirit indwells Christians. We abide in God and God is said to abide in us. It's the oneness that we're going to enjoy in all eternity. This is just a foretaste of that oneness that we'll enjoy then. It's the oneness of the bridegroom and his bride. And Paul says, that's a great mystery, but I speak of the church, Jesus Christ and his bride, the church. Oneness now in this includes oneness of mind, oneness of purpose, oneness of mission. That's the first pur purpose, that we may be one as we are, that they may be one as we are, the Lord says. Second essential purpose for this keeping is verse 13, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. He says in verse 13, but now I come to you and these things I speak in the world so that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. That oneness and the promise of that eventual oneness that's coming should provoke joy in the Christian. Even our difficult circumstances in this world should lead to rejoicing. Lord says in Luke chapter six, verse 22, he says, blessed are you when men hate you. Blessed are you when they exclude you and revile you and cast out your name as evil for the son of man's sake. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy for indeed your reward is great in heaven for in like manner their fathers did to the prophets. Jerry Bridges calls joylessness in the Christian life, he calls it a practical atheism. Oh, why is that? Because the Christian knows that in all his circumstances, God is on the throne and God works all things together for our good. So to be joyless as a Christian Jerry Bridges would say is a, a practical form of atheism. You're denying God's goodness toward you in all of your circumstance. So are you, are you focused only on your circumstances or are you focused on Christ, right? Do you have your eyes so glued to that trial that you, you can't see Christ behind it? We have every reason to be joyful and we can look forward to being one with God. This is what we've been saved to, amen? Amen, let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for this text. I pray that you'd be with us as we work through the, the second part of this, Lord, to see what you, Jesus Christ, have prayed for on our behalf. And it gives us great joy to consider these things, Lord. Uh, help us, Lord, help this to impact the way that we think, the way that we understand these things, the way that we deal with our desires, the way that we reject worldliness. Help us, Lord, to keep ourselves unstained by this world. Preserve us in your grace and in your mercy to us. For Christ's sake, for your glory, God, preserve us. Help us, Lord, to endure to the end to be saved. Help us, Lord, to persevere, to take these warnings seriously, to obey your word, knowing, Lord, that it is a means by which you preserve us. And we thank you, Lord, that it's not our strength. It's not our wisdom. We don't persevere by our own power. But Lord, we praise you that it's by your power, your strength, your wisdom, by your work, your doing, that we persevere to the end to be saved. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.